Welcome to the 2021 summation of the year in the entertainment industry. And what a year this has been. It's been a year of both a lot of complications, a lot of really, really good things happening, and moreover, a real indication of the true battle that's going on within Hollywood and what Hollywood will be in the future. To sum it all up, let's actually compare two movies that came out in this December season and how their respective successes or failures are indicative of the two different sides of the entertainment industry as it stands right now and the battle royale that's going on between them. The first of these movies is Spider-Man No Way Home. And I know it's a populist movie. It was a big hit. It, 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 it's, it's kind of anti-intellectual. It's very, very old Hollywood. Aha, that is the key. The truth about Spider-Man No Way Home is that it is a throwback to classical filmmaking styles, which means it is very, very focused on pleasing its core audience. It knows definitely who its audience is, why they go, how to please them, and how to, in fact, while doing that, perhaps throw in a couple of things on the side that might make fans happy. In its own way, Spider-Man No Way Home could have been made in the 1940s. And I picked the 1940s because that was uh, during World War II. And during World War II, the country was going through a lot of trauma, a lot of existential angst. Could easily tie in with the 30s as well when there was the Depression. But the 40s is actually better because there, there was this war going on and part of the joy of going to the movies was to provide a way to survive if you were on the home front. If you were a troop, you knew the reality of what the situation was and you'd rather not think about it. But 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 by and large, if you were at home, you needed memories of why things should um, should, should 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 move forward and what your own particular piece in it is. Because what is Spider-Man No Way Home truly about. It's about the Tom Holland version of Spider-Man realizing, just like Rick in Casablanca, and I know that sounds like a big comparison, but I don't think it's incorrect, where, uh, where at the end of Casablanca, Rick decides that it's better if he let his girlfriend go off with Victor Laszlo, who can then do his part to battle against the National Socialists. And he realizes that that is more important than his own feelings. Such the opposite from The English Patient, which also won Best Picture and is really, really a horrible movie. And, and I think uh, it, it's failed the test of time for this reason. It's very nihilistic and cynical. Spider-Man No Way Home does that at its end. Now, I'm Asian, we don't believe in spoilers. So I'm not gonna spoil this one because I'm now in the United States, obviously. But um, in, in, in No Way Home, Spider-Man does something that has an enormous personal cost to him, enormous. And he's okay because he knows it's what he must do. And because of that, the movie works beautifully. We end up having a sense of loss. We end up uh, leaving the theater feeling better about humanity because that's what Hollywood in effect has really been about for most of its existence, not recently. And we'll get to that in a second, but I find it ironic that No Way Home was made by Sony, a Japanese company. Because let me tell you something about a Japanese company. Remember, I lived in Japan when I was in high school. And I have a lot of friends from that high school era that I'm still in contact with. So I'm, I'm still got my hands in a little bit on what's happening there. When something goes disastrously wrong, the company will always try to figure out how to fix it. 
Now, maybe sometimes that fixing it, uh, we'd look at as being, well, that's not really a great way to fix it. You know, you'd uh, put one of your executives in the, in the die at the government building and, and, and have them vote for you to get a bailout of some sort. But, but somehow or another, you're going to figure it out and fix it. Clearly, after the huge failure of Ghostbusters 16, and even though I liked it a lot, the moderately disappointing um, uh, 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 Spider's Man into the Spider-Verse, which featured Miles Morales, uh, Sony took a step back and said, look, guys, we can't play in this big game if we're going to F it up as badly as we did this time. To their credit, they didn't kick Amy Pascal to the curb. Instead, I think, no proof of this, by the way, but I'll bet she had a little trip to Japan where she was basically told, you done effed up, fix it. And they gave her and her team, this is a conjecture on my part, the time to do the Spider-Man franchise right, to not make the mistakes that were made in Ghostbusters 2016. And guess what? It came out fine. Now let's move over to Disney and take a look at our second film. And uh, note that Disney was so unsure of this that they used the 20th century moniker of 20th Century Fox, which they bought out in 2018-19. Uh, and paid way too much for it, uh, to brand it. And that is West Side Story. Why didn't that have the Disney brand on us released through Disney? They own 20th Century Fox. Obviously, they knew there was something wrong with it. And indeed, there was. Steven Spielberg's unnecessary remake of the 1961 mega musical that uh, won multiple Academy Awards. And even though I'll admit that I really didn't like it uh, when the first few times I saw it, because I was watching it on TV, cut up with commercials, panned and scanned, all the other stuff. Uh, so I, I didn't really like it, but I've come to appreciate it a lot in, uh, in over the years, especially after I first saw it uh, projected um, it, at the LA County Museum where the print had a big scratch on it because there was only one or two 70 millimeter prints in existence at that point and, and saw what it was really like to experience it the way moviegoers in the 1960s had experienced it. And I really, really appreciated it. And also by that time, I had come to appreciate Natalie Wood, who people forget used to be the, the, the real live model for the Harvard Lampoon Movie Worst Awards when, when uh, and she actually took humor in it and showed up and allowed herself to be presented to one of the award uh, winners of Movie Worst, Natalie Wood Award for Worst Actress. And, uh, and she, though, is luminous in the movie. Maybe she's ethnically incorrect, but she's still luminous in the movie. And that's what a feature film needs. You need someone in the center of it who is fantastic. The problem with the new West Side Story is that it was never going to be great. And the reason it was never going to be great is that it was a movie about the supports. All of the supporting people in the new West Side Story are really pretty terrific. Um, and, and that includes Rita Moreno, who is playing a role that probably wouldn't have existed in real life in the way she's portrayed here. It doesn't matter. She still, she still walks away with the picture. The actress who plays Anita is very, very uh, good as well. And so to varying degrees are the others. Um, I especially like the guy who played Bernardo. I think he was better than George Shakiris, by the way. He, he, he brought a, a native toughness to it and, and you believed he ran that gang. And the fact that he was a boxer on top of that was, was, was a nice extra. However, the two leads in this are very dim. In the new version, Rachel Zegler plays Maria and 
I know people are saying she should win Best Actress. She shouldn't. She's terrible in it. Okay, she's not terrible. She gives a good serviceable performance in it. She's someone who would have been a good supporting performer, but she does not have the magnetism of Natalie Wood. She does not have that ability to take over the screen and, and, and make us appreciate um, exactly the life force that a Maria must have. And the fact that she's not dubbed means nothing, because after all, uh, you, you care about the charisma of the performers. And, and the reason dubbing was used in, in the past was so that you could have really, really solid performance of uh, performances by the leads, the, the people who would be your entree into the film. Um, and, and again, she's not horrible, but she's also not charismatic. She is completely knocked out by Ariana DeBose, who plays this version of Anita. I, I still think Rita Moreno is a little bit of a better Anita, but, but I, I'm willing to debate that. I'm willing to get into debates with people over she and Rita Moreno because, because she's definitely uh, really, really good. But against, um, uh, against uh, Zegler, uh, she completely blows her off the screen. And worse than that, Ansel Elgort, who plays Tony, made me long for Richard Boehmer. Now, remember, Richard Boehmer somehow, somehow was able to get major roles in Diary of Anne Frank, in uh, Longest Day, in West Side Story, and in Hemingway's Adventures of, of a Young Man without ever proving that he could grab hold of the screen and be charismatic. He was kind of like a pretty boy, but unlike Rock Hudson, who had a little bit of that undercurrent in him, maybe it was a sexuality, who knows, but, but, but he had that, that, that little bit of hesitancy in him that made him interesting, that, that even if he couldn't necessarily emote well, you, you, you were with him. Uh, uh, Elgort doesn't have that at all. And, and, and his cringy moments, such as singing Maria, such as uh, the, the wedding scene, and this is just all over the place, uh, it, it, it just doesn't fit. Now, here's the problem. When you don't have charismatic leads and your supports walk away with the picture, you are not throwing the picture to your supports at, at, because the, the audiences don't go see a movie because of who your supporting players are. They go for your leads. As in 1991's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, early testing said that Morgan Freeman and Alan Rickman were walking away with the film. And this was a problem because even though Kevin Costner was rated mildly above the norm in terms of excellence, uh, ratings. He was not carrying the picture. So what did the producers do? They made a really cataclysmic decision, and that was to eviscerate Morgan Freeman and Alan Rickman's performances to where they were literally incoherent performances. But it didn't matter because now all of a sudden the Kevin Costner performance, by definition, rose in everyone's estimation. And the movie went on to be a big hit. Now today we look at it and it's a mess. But at the time, it did what it was supposed to do, which is make a lot of money. Now, what happened with West Side Story is in spite of all of the things that are wrong with it, it has a lot right with it. It, it has pretty good choreography and in the numbers. There's some weird editing in it and there's some weird cinematography in it where it's like, okay, well, people don't make musicals anymore. So it's not an ingrained thing to know how to shoot a number properly. So, okay, we'll, we'll give it that. Sort of like when you start shooting a film in a foreign country and you're hiring local and, and their cinematography is all wrong because it, it has a different aesthetic from the US or your production design is all wrong because they have a different color aesthetic from the US. Anyway, um, what, 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 what's, what's wrong with it is that they totally blew the marketing. They blew it to such a degree that I couldn't believe it. It's like, what is wrong with you? This is not rocket science. This has been done for over 100 years. You should know how to sell a movie. And what they did with West Side Story is they positioned it as if it was a bonnets and carriages, merchant and ivory picture. They, they Instead of focusing on the dynamicism of a romance that's taking place in a world that's blowing apart with gang warfare, and, and in the middle of all that, you have all of these great songs. And, and in, in between that, you have these tender romantic moments. So it's a film that gives you everything. 
instead, you got this kind of softish, soft cell and really artsy. And you need to see this movie, not you want to see it. And moreover, in classic woke Hollywood fashion, it was as if the entire marketing campaign was concocted by rich Beverly Hills matrons who have no connection with the real world and, and or, or, or with a minority population. Uh, first of all, in every single interview, both Tony Kushner, the screenwriter, and, and Steven Spielberg talk about Latinx, Latinx, Latinx. I'm sorry, I teach a lot of Latino students. They don't like that word. It is derogatory. It is insulting to the Spanish language. And I don't care that a Puerto Rican lesbian came up with it. That was an agenda-oriented phrase. And, and uh, when you're dealing with a macho culture, that is not a way to, to, to characterize it. And not only that, they spent a lot of publicity talking about how all the accents were correct. Well, they weren't. I'm, get, I'm taking this on faith from what my students have told me, but they said, no, the accents were wrong. In the same way that when Hollywood actors try to put on a British accent, they're wrong. They might've been schooled in it, it's still wrong. And, and worse, you once again have a half white person, Hitler, playing, an, uh, playing a Puerto Rican and she's Colombia. Okay, well, this is Hollywood again. Uh, Chinese people and Japanese people and Koreans are all the same, so we can cast them as each other, right? And that's exactly what happened here. So, so now you've blown the Hispanic community out of the water. They don't want to see it. So in other words, you created a movie that was already problematic in, in what it felt was an outreach. Then you had Steven Spielberg say, uh, well, we're not going to subtitle the Spanish because we're not, we're, not going to honor, we're not going to prioritize the English over it. And I say as an Asian, F you. You're now saying that, that, that white people will get mad. Good. Well, how about Asian people who will get mad because they won't understand it? How about black people who will get mad because they don't understand it? How about people from, uh, from other countries who won't understand it? Uh, you are absolutely shutting them out. And guess who else you're shutting out? You're shutting out the females who are 50 plus who love musicals. Now, they're not going to go see it because they think it's in a foreign language that they won't have, be able to understand. So the fact that that movie bombed makes sense. But look at the reasons it bombed. It bombed because everyone involved in the making of it did not care for their audience one bit. What they wanted the film to be was their own way to say, look at how wonderful and advanced and, 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 and how, 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 how terrific uh, us rich people in Hollywood are. And because of that, they alienated everybody. But isn't that what's going on with every movie, it seems like? What happened with The Eternals? What happened with the recent uh, Matrix rebooted movie? What's, what happened in 2016 with, um, with, with Ghostbusters? Obviously, Sony learned the lesson. Obviously, no one else in Hollywood did, or at least no one in the big end of it. So that leads us to where we are today with a company like Discovery buying um, bu buying Warner Brothers because they're from the world of basic cable and they've made a lot of success in the world of basic cable during a period when basic cable was supposedly dead, they have every potential of becoming enormously strong in knowing how to leverage what they have to the audience they want. Moreover, they understand the need to bring in new people, A, because they're cheap, B, because they're going to be innovative. C, because you're going to leave them alone because they're cheap and innovative. And D, that means that if one of them hits, it can drag up 10 others. And so with that model in mind, you now have a big chunk of Hollywood that is no longer following the uh, Netflix slash Disney slash former Warner Brothers mantra, of spend, 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 and China will cover it or uh, the foreign market will cover it, or an eternally growing uh, market will cover it. No, these are based in reality. So now we have Sony, we have um, Universal, which has never really played the uh, escalating cost game and being led by their chief producer, uh, uh, Blumhouse, who does really cheap movies that make a big profit. And, um, 
And, and, and now you're going to see, hopefully, Discovery Warner joining that. Uh, what about Paramount? Well, Paramount is, what about it? It's, it's, uh, it's a major becoming a mini major, unless some miracle happens. They're, they're down for the count. I, I, don't, I don't see them being able to pull out of it. I don't see the Redstones uh, treating the company like a real public corporation as opposed to a private company, which is what they've been doing forever and no one stopped them. So therefore, um, I, I, I don't see how they can, they can survive. The fact that they've sold off almost all of their real estate, uh, most recently Radford Studios in the Valley. Uh, also, they sold off their, their big lot on uh, Beverly and Fairfax, a television city, and they sold off their big building in New York City. All right, that's $3 billion right there that they no longer have on their asset sheet. They didn't sell those because, hey, it was a prudent time to sell it. No, they sold it because they had to. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of bearish on them, although they also have incredible amounts of content. So maybe they'll have someone come in and once again, rely on Star Trek and Mission Impossible to rescue them. Um, so in, 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 a, in short, uh, how is the, and also the agency has learned how to, how to cope with COVID. Uh, it's still difficult. There's still times when shoots get shut down. This has definitely impacted the lower end of the business. But by and large, you leave it to the entertainment industry and the first ADs, uh, first assistant directors, to figure out how to make stuff work, and they usually do. And, and so there's a lot more production going on now than ever. So there's more chances of people getting in. This is why I remain bullish on the industry as a whole. Yes, we have the problem with the people who are the ones who do the West Side stories. Um, and we have, but we do have the people who turned around and made uh, the Spider-Man um, um, uh, No Way Home. So uh, it will be a little bit of a cultural battle, but I have a really good sense of who's ultimately gonna win. Because if you look at Hollywood, and like they say, history doesn't necessarily repeat, but oh, does it rhyme sweetly. That's what we're watching right now. We're watching um, a collapse of a bad business model. And that can only lead to improvements down the road. 